Hello friends, welcome to Experience Data Talk, a show featuring data science leaders and technologists from around the world. My name is Mike Delgado, and this is episode number 116. Today we're chatting with Dr. Gleb Saporsky about ways to lead your business and employees through the coronavirus crisis. I don't know about you, but I feel like everything happened super quickly. You know, one minute we were working in our offices with our teams, the next we need to stay home to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And right now, as we're working remotely, you know, it's tough. Like we're trying to balance home life with work. You know, sometimes we're working at the kitchen table. Sometimes we are in a child's bedroom. We're all just trying to figure this out. Right now, I'm actually in my son's bedroom, surrounded by, you know, stuffed animals and toys, which is actually great. (laughs) Makes me feel better. And you know, the trouble with working remotely is that we tend to overwork. You know, we never feel like we're done. There's always more messages to get back to on Slack, more emails. We have more video calls now, and it's tough. We're trying to figure out how best to navigate this period, how to stay productive, how to stay connected with our teams. And then on top of that, we have the emotional issues going on, right? Anxiety, stress, not sure about the future, all that combined makes working really, really difficult. This is why I'm super excited we have a chance to learn from Dr. Saporsky today. He's the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts and has been focusing on helping protect leaders from business disasters using cutting edge cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics research. His work has been featured by NPR, Scientific American, Business Insider, and Time Magazine. He's also consulted at a bunch of global companies like Aflac, Honda, IBM, Xerox, and the World Wildlife Fund. He's also the best-selling author of three books, and one of his books is called Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters which is actually a great resource right now for those of us wanting to be driven by data and not our emotions. It was a super big honor for me to chat with him, to hear his perspectives on ways businesses can navigate this very difficult and unpredictable time. In today's chat, Dr. Saporsky shares ways leaders need to change business models. He also talks about crisis management and creating business continuity plans during difficult and unpredictable times. He shares strategies on how leaders can best display empathy with their employees. He discusses ways teams should manage conflict, especially when we work remotely. This conversation on COVID-19 with Dr. Saporsky is packed with a ton of scientific insights, and I took a ton of notes. I'm super excited to share this interview with you. But before we do, I want to apologize for any sort of household sounds you might hear in the background. Since I'm recording at home, you might hear some birds chirping, some cars passing by, my wife washing her hands in the kitchen across from me. These are all kind of the sounds happening in my house. We're trying to be really quiet, but, you know, life happens. So, Uh, My apologies for that. Let's get to today's interview. Well, Gleb, thank you so much for being part of our Data Talk. Excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Right now, obviously, we're in the midst of this pandemic. A lot of us are working from home. And a lot of the work that you're doing is around disaster avoidance and helping leaders um, prepare for situations like this. And I was wondering if you can kind of share a little bit about the work that you do um, the consulting that you do for companies and leaders? Sure. I can talk about the consulting and then we can talk separately about the kind of problems that are running up with COVID-19. But the kind of work I do is I help leaders, organizations avoid disasters, manage risks, make good decisions, and have good strategic plans. Now, my background is in cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics. So that's where I come from. I come from that academic world, but I haven't started my career in the academic world. I started by looking at how people make decisions and becoming a trainer and consultant and coach in that area. So I started by looking at training, consulting, coaching, and speaking to folks on these topics because really we don't have very good ways of making decisions. There's that old trope of going with your gut, following your intuition, going, trusting your feelings. Unfortunately, way too many leaders do that. They think that just because they feel a certain way that whatever they feel is right. Too many people do that, and it results in really bad decisions, despite me telling them many times that, you know, hey, this is a big problem, that you do what you feel like you should do. People don't get that. They don't get that they should not trust their gut feelings. They shouldn't trust their intuitions. But our intuitions lie to us because of problems with how our brain is wired, and we can talk about that. And basically, our brain is wired to not be function well in the modern business environment, professional environment. So having learned that, I went to graduate school. And in graduate school, I learned the cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics behind why we make such atrocious decisions. We can talk about atrocious decisions with COVID-19, 
but there are many, many others, of course, that result in disasters, whether for businesses, whether for small businesses, large businesses, or individuals with their career plans, result in disasters. That's a big problem. And I learned this topic, and then I started doing more consulting, coaching, and training. So I run a company called Disaster Avoidance Experts of six consultant coaches and trainers. So I'm the leader, and I've been featured in venues like NBC, Fast Company, Time, Inc. Magazine, recently an entrepreneur, talking about these topics, published a number of best-selling books, including those ones, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. That's my best-known one. It's a bestseller. And it talks about how do we address the dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that cause us to have really big, serious problems in our careers and our business decisions. That's fantastic. You've been doing this for such a long time, and I love that you have just a strong academic and research background in the behavioral sciences, uh, neuroscience, and also just in the, as you mentioned, oftentimes we will make decisions based on our gut feelings. Yes, data is important, and we should be pulling on uh, making decisions based on data, um, but so often we're led by our decisions. Can you talk a little bit about why is it that we gravitate towards our gut instincts rather than looking at what data we have available to us? Well, it's simple. Gut instincts feel comfortable, and we often just go with what feels comfortable to us. I mean, think about your everyday daily decisions. People prefer comfortable things, and it's very hard to go outside of your comfort zone. If we think a certain choice is right, it's not because we have the data to support that it's right. It's because we feel it's right. We tend to perceive ourselves as thinking it's right, but that's not what actually happens. What actually happens is a gut feeling, a feeling that this is right. And then we go after we have that feeling, we try to rationalize it by gathering data to support our feeling. <laughs> so that's what very often happens. Business decisions, professional decisions of all sorts, of course, life decisions are done through this process of cherry picking, where you're looking for information that confirms your beliefs and ignoring information that doesn't. That's a specific cognitive bias called the confirmation bias where that's exactly what it describes. You might have heard of that. It's where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs, ignore information that doesn't. So let's say if you are doing an interview for a potential candidate you want to hire. Now, if you click with that person, if that person feels like you would be working well together with that person, you will be much more likely to find evidence that this person would be a good hire. Even so, that person may not be the best fit for the job at all, you're going to look for evidence and try to shoehorn that person in, you know, square peg into a round hole because you click with that person, it feels comfortable. So people trust their feelings overwhelmingly in business decisions, collaborations with others and so on. And why is that? Well, because our gut intuitions, our gut feelings, they are meant to be tribal. That's what they come from. They come from that savanna environment when we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. And we had to be very strongly tribal as hunter-gatherers because if we weren't very tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. Or our tribe would fall apart and then we would die. We're the descendants of those people who didn't die. <laughs> so therefore, we are very tribally oriented. We want to look for people who we click with, who look like us, who think like us, who share values and so on. Now that's very often a bad idea if you have too many people like you. So for example, I, as a person, suffer from what's called the optimism bias. Now the optimism bias is kind of like what it sounds. I tend to think the world is a nice place. I feel at least the world is a nice place. I feel I'm optimistic about the future. I think that things will be good. I tend to ignore risks, only look at opportunities, and tend to have very high expectations for myself and for other people. So I naturally, intuitively, want to work with other optimists. So when I'm trying to hire people, I click very much with other optimists. When I'm having a business collaboration, doing deciding what to do business, I very much click with other optimists. But what I have learned through studying cognitive biases, like the optimism bias, is that if I hire or work with too many optimists, whether as business collaborators or as people who are in my company, who I hire for myself, work with me, that causes serious problems because I'm the kind of person who has 20 ideas before breakfast. And I think all of them are brilliant. <laughs> now, that I have learned to my bitter experience, they're not all brilliant. <laughs> so 
you know, I know that what I need to do with those ideas is I need to hand them off to a pessimist. And the pessimist will say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but, you know, these three are worth finishing baking. And then they'll fix all the flaws in these three ideas, and they'll implement the project as well. What would happen if I worked with optimists? Well, I'd have 20 brilliant ideas, and they'd have 20 brilliant ideas. And we'd reinforce each other. We'd say, now we have 40 brilliant ideas. Let's go and do all these things. <laughs> That's what happens when I work with optimists, as I've learned. That's not good. It doesn't work very well for a business. And very many businesses, you know, you probably know the statistics that about half of all small businesses fail, startups fail within the first five years, 10 fail, you know, within the first year, 10 years, about two thirds fail, within the first 15 years, about 75% fail. That's because they often hire the wrong people. They often hire people who are optimists, higher optimists, for example, and they run into many directions and then they fail. <laughs> what they need to do, and that these are just two out of over 100 cognitive biases that you need to account for. You need to hire pessimists so that you make sure to filter these brilliant ideas and actually take the, <laughs> take the good ones and implement them well. Now, pessimists wouldn't be working well with a team of pessimists either because you just wouldn't be having ideas. You'd just be you know, criticizing each other's ideas. That's unhelpful too. So that, that's some examples of where the confirmation bias, together with other two other biases, leads to really bad decision making in business settings because of our tribalism. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, just the, the the strategy of having a diverse workforce, you have a diverse team, is going to enhance um, the overall um, idea making, um, getting different perspectives. Because like an optimist might have, like like you, you come in the morning and you have like 15 like great ideas, like oh let's write let's write an article on that, let's do a podcast on that. And if you have a lot of other enthusiastic optimists, you're right. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. I'll, I'll work on that. You work on that. Um, but then having some like realists in the room, having some pessimists in the room is going to add some more flavor. And like, well, let's think more about that. Let's think about maybe that's not going to be best suited for our time. We only have a finite amount of time. But having those diverse voices can definitely help, I think. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so you need to know that I know I don't like working with pessimists. Let's just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. It doesn't feel pleasant to me. It's not yeah. comfortable because it feels very comfortable for me to work with other people. Op they're optimists who just say, you know, yes, let's do that. Let's work on all these things, right? It feels very good. But I know that that's the wrong thing to do, even though it feels good. It feels comfortable. From the perspective of making the right decision, that's a very bad idea. I need to work with people who make me uncomfortable in order to make the best decisions and implement projects in the best possible manner. And it feels very uncomfortable. And that's the critical thing. Businesses so much run on what feels good and what feels comfortable and not wanting to make any waves, not wanting to have any arguments, not wanting to have pessimists in the room, you know, not wanting to have team conflicts. And that's very bad if you don't have that because you make the wrong decisions and you pursue the wrong projects. So those are just some of the bad things that come from having optimists and pessimists, we haven't even started talking about COVID-19. Yeah, th that's really good. And um, I guess I, I would love just to hear a little bit more just direct tips for leaders as they're building out their teams, uh, being mindful of this bias that we're probably going to be more likely to want to hire someone like us, mm -hmm. but to avoid groupthink, to avoid the problems like you're bringing up. What are some things, some actionable things leaders should be thinking about as they are building out their teams? What they want to know is the kind of cognitive diversity that exists in their teams. So is their team made up of mostly overwhelmingly optimists? Then you need to make sure to hire some pessimists in the team. Is your team made up of too many pessimists? So it's unlikely if you're a small startup leader that your team is made up of pessimists. But if you are, let's say, working in an IT department, the IT department, especially with the security staff, will often, the more security-minded IT department folks will often be pessimists. And that will, of course, impede some of their ability to generate important and valuable new ideas. So you'll want to make sure to hire some optimists. So those are just two out of very many cognitive biases. There are over 100 of them that exist. So if you know that, let's say, that you tend to fall into what's called the planning fallacy. The planning fallacy has to do with us tending to be very confident about ourselves and be very confident about their plans 
and then make plans that I saw that they will go right and think that all of our plans will go right. It feels very comfortable to do that. It feels very comfortable to, okay, I made a plan, let's go according to this plan. But very often the plan will not survive context with the enemy and we tend to forget that. So there's the saying that, you know, oh, planning to failing to plan is planning to fail. That's a problematic saying because you will often have a plan and think that it will succeed just because you have a plan. Reality is that failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So you need to plan for problems, look for problems, not simply opportunities. So if you are the kind of person who tends to fall into the planning fallacy, you'll often see that, let's say, you know, you'll have many projects or your team will have many projects that go over time or over budget. So if that's the kind of problems you tend to run into, then you need to make sure to get some people on your team who are much more realistic about their planning and who have much better estimates about the time that, and money that certain projects take. So you want to know what are the weaknesses in your team? What are the cognitive biases that your team is most prone to? And make sure to look for people who would complement your team's current weaknesses, where the areas are weak. You don't want to hire the same people who have the same strengths and same weaknesses, which is overwhelmingly what tends to happen, where teams bring in people who look like them in their mindset, who think like them, rather than thinking differently and having challenging thought patterns. It's uncomfortable, but it's very important. You, I like how, what you just said about the planning. And right now, a lot of leaders, a lot of companies right now are trying to plan on how they're going to navigate this COVID-19 uh, situation. And everything from campaigns to crisis management plans to how they're going to work with their remote employees. And I was wondering if you can speak to um, – how can organizations develop plans that are going to be thoughtful during a very unpredictable time like right now? The first thing to realize is that we have some very problematic impulses, instincts that come from our gut that cause us to make bad decisions around COVID-19. So let's go back to the Savannah. In the Savannah environment, our primary response to threats, our gut response to threats, is the fight or flight response. So where we had to jump at 100 shadows to get away from that one saber to tiger. That was very important in the Savannah environment. We faced threats that were immediate in the moment and intense for our very life. So we tend to, right now, when we respond to threats, we respond to threats in the same way. We make very quick, very immediate decisions that are either fight or flight. That's not really good in, front, in the face of COVID-19. It's not something that you can easily respond to with fight or flight. I mean, you can see right now a lot of people are going, let's say, doing panic shopping, buying things that they don't need. That's a, would, would their way of trying to fight the situation. And you see other people fleeing, which is ignoring the situation, thinking it's not a big deal. They don't want to acknowledge the gravity of the situation. That's the flight response. And you see a lot of that going on within companies as well. There are many leaders who are really ignoring it, who are just saying, oh, the stupid governor who is shutting down you know, business, that's really bad for a company. Why, is, why are they doing that? This is not a big deal. It's no, no worse than common cold, right? And you see a lot of other people who are very much in the fight mode and who are kind of emergency thinking, what are all the things that we need to do right now, fixing this emergency, fixing this problem, you know, virtual teams, everything, you know, go home. Neither of these responses is the right response because people who are in the flight response are obviously going to really suffer when the COVID-19 reaches their company, people who work in the company, if they have, if they, if their governor hasn't shut down the company, hasn't shut down the workplace, then they'll get sick. Obviously, it's a huge problem, which and that's pretty clear. But the fight response is also very problematic because these people are functioning in emergency mode. Now, in emergency mode, we you know, go home, you know, work from home and so on, all of these emergency planning, that is going to only carry you through in a couple of weeks. It's pretty useful in an emergency situation of the kind that we're used to. Let's say, you know, Houston was flooded, right? It stayed flooded for, you know, a week maybe, two weeks. And that's the kind of thing that you can use your adrenaline to carry you through. But imagine if Houston got flooded and then stayed flooded. Imagine that situation. That's the situation we're in right now. We're not in an emergency situation. We're in a new normal situation. So this is a very different situation. You can't 
get through it through the fight, through the fight response or the flight response. We are not evolved to deal with slow moving train wrecks like the COVID-19 pandemic. That's not what our gut reaction is prepared for. So our feelings are going to lie to us. They're going to tell us to do the wrong things. And the large majority of business leaders are going to follow these feelings and are going to do the wrong things. They don't realize how bad COVID-19 is going to be in the long term. So there are a number of things around it that are going to be pretty bad. It's going to not, you know, the shutdowns that we have right now, they're going to last through, I mean, May, June, whatever. And then some states may open up, but then COVID-19 will increase in that state and that state will have to shut down. Otherwise, the hospital capacity will be flooded. And so what we'll have is not simply a short period or you know, a couple of months of shutdowns and then we'll be opening back up and then everything will be fine. It will be a series of shutdowns and opening back up and so on. The COVID-19 may well be even stronger. It might weaken in the summer, but become quite a bit stronger in the fall and the winter of next year and so on. It might become cyclical. It might become, it might just stay strong in the summer because right now we have Louisiana cases and Miami cases spreading pretty quickly. So that's bad. So if, if, if it's just a struggle in the summer. So we know that this thing will be around for a while until a vaccine is created. And a vaccine won't be created for the next you know, 12 to 18 months. And then of course, it'll take another year or so to produce enough of the vaccine and distribute it to protect at least the older people and the vulnerable people. So it's going to be at least two to three years until, and that's the optimistic scenario until it, it, the elderly are protected, until more, the more vulnerable people are protected. And that assumes that the first vaccines that we create are going to be perfectly effective, 100% effective. They might well not be. You know, it might take many years to create a really effective vaccine because it takes a long time to test each vaccine. So that's why it's a big problem. Given that, it might be an optimistic scenario, two to three years, more pessimistic scenarios, more like five to seven years, what you're seeing right now is the new normal, and you need to prepare your company for that new normal. You need to throw out your old uh, strategic plans, which most companies are still functioning by those strategic plans. They're not thinking about you know, their long-term product release. They're thinking, okay, we'll be just doing a couple of months of virtual teams, and then we'll launch our product like that we had planned, the six-month product launch. That's not going to happen. Or if it does happen, you'll be really screwed if that does happen because it will not work for you. That's not what you need to do. You need to think about right now, very seriously, changing your business model. And by business model, I mean two things. I mean, your, one of the things is your internal structure, your internal collaboration. Right now, people have gone to work from home and most are functioning in that, the vast majority are functioning in that emergency mode. They're driven by adrenaline. So right now they're collaborating well, they're pulled together in the crisis, but of course, you know, in, the, in a month or so, a couple of months, that will fail. And you all need to figure out, how will you engage these people? <laughs> the large majority of people who are not used to working from home. They are used to working being surrounded by their colleagues who provide motivation and support for them. So if they're at home isolated after the adrenaline fades, you need to figure out how to engage these people already we have a crisis of employee engagement where only a third of the employees in the United States, according to Gallup surveys, are fully engaged with their work. So that's a third. Most of the rest, about, uh, about 50%, are somewhat disengaged, meaning they're, they ju they're just clocking in, they're just you know, punching the clock, and about 15% or so are actively disengaged. They're hostile, they're looking for a new job, and so on you'll have many more people shifting at least into the middle category from the actively engaged. And the actively engaged, you know, the Pareto principle where 20% of the people produce 80% of the useful work. Well, these are the people who are actively engaged who are producing most of the useful work. You'll need to find a way to keep them engaged and get more people engaged in a virtual setting. So that's going to be a big problem. Now, another big problem that companies are overwhelmingly not thinking about is how are you going to solve pro problems, conflicts, tensions? A lot of the tensions and conflicts are solved right now by people just meeting and chatting over the water cooler, catching problems, nipping them in the bud, or resolving conflicts with those face-to-face -face conversations. That's not happening right now. Problems are not being nipped in the bud, and conflicts aren't being resolved over face-to-face -face conversations. 
I mean, I've had situations where, I, as I did consulting through, in not in virtual teams, but in long distance teams. So there was a central office and local teams. The, there's a lot of conflict that arises in these situations between central office and local teams because they don't see each other communicate mainly by email, by video conference occasionally. And there are lots of people aren't used to resolving these problems. You don't feel that human connection, person to person connection, and that causes a lot of problems and tensions. So conflicts, that's a conflict of nipping problems in the bud is another one. And third is how are you going to cultivate trust? Right now, trust is being cultivated for people seeing each other face to face, having those conversations about their kids, you know, about stuff outside of work, stuff, stuff that they're excited about, sports, you know, sports ball, all of that stuff. And that's not happening right now. People are not having those communications. They're not having those conversations. Those relationships are going to start, they're already starting to deteriorate and they will deteriorate even further. So that trust that provides the basis for teamwork, for collaboration is being eroded, is being degraded. And you need to figure out how to cultivate that trust in virtual settings. There are, of course, techniques to do that. But that is something that needs to be addressed, that needs to be done. And finally, you'll need to make sure to have accountability. So you as a leader can just right now or prior, you know, January or February 2020, you can just walk around, see what people are doing, say hi to them, check in what's going on. You can't do that. How are you going to maintain accountability for your team when they're not in emergency mode, they're not crushing the emergency mode? So this is kind of internal stuff. And the external stuff, you need to just as much think about how are you going to handle your external service delivery. Whatever you're doing, you will need to continually do it online. Right now, people are giving, willing to give you a break. Clients are willing to give you a break because of COVID-19. Everyone is in emergency mode. Well, that you know, spirit of cheerfulness and support will pass in a month or so. So you need to figure out how to function in a regular, normal setting where you do virtual service delivery, whatever you're doing, virtual product delivery. When you're collaborating with vendors, how are you going to collaborate with them? How will you resolve problems? Cultivate trust. With your clients, how are you going to resolve problems? Cultivate trust. All of these things that I'm talking about. You need to be thinking about these things. You know, I'm working with a company of lawyers, and one of their biggest problems that they're not realizing, but we're working on right now, is that they need to you know, they can deliver their documents online and they can give their, their advice online, but the cultivation of trust is incredibly important when you're a professional service provider, whether you provide legal services, accounting, whatever. So much professional service provide, there's so many companies that are working in the professional service provision area. And cultivating trust with clients is so important here. If you can't do that face to face, how are you going to do it? So that is another big area. And something to think about is that as you are adjusting yourself and adjusting your company for that long-term perspective, the long-term haul of two to three years or you know, five to seven years, a number of your competitors will not be doing that. So they will be hobbled by the fact that they're still think that this is an emergency as opposed to the new normal, and they're not thinking about the long-term. So you need to think about how will you effectively take that market share that they will be losing as they are not prepared to come to adjust and adapt to the long-term consequences of COVID-19. I love how you're um, just giving us all a really good perspective of this is the new normal. And that's I think that's the right mind frame. It's the right way to be viewing all of this because I think originally when all everything was happening, like all the messaging that we saw was like, this is gonna be two weeks, like work from home for two weeks. Yep. That was kind of the original messaging. And when I first heard that, I and then and, and just watching this pandemic unfold globally, I started thinking like it's not there's no way it could be two weeks. Like this is much more severe. And when I started looking at the the data visualizations from New York Times around like the high points, at least in California where I'm at, it looked like um if people were not practicing social distancing, that the pandemic would get uh would skyrocket in May and and in June would kind of flatline. And so I'm like, we're in April right now. This is like the month where things are starting to increase. We're seeing more and more infections. A lot more people have it that, and they don't even know they have it yet. And so, yeah, we're we're in this, you're right, this new normal. We're all trying to adapt. And for those of us who are brand new to working from home or working virtually, um, we're all trying to figure out, like, how do we continue to build trust with our teams? Because you're right. 
at the foundation, it's like it comes down to companies that are going to thrive are going to be the companies that are able to maintain the relationships with employees, that productivity, that trust. It's got to be there. And the companies that can figure it out, the people that can figure it out faster are going to be more efficient and can definitely take market share. Um, what, you know, you have been studying this and, and for such a long time, what are some things that uh, leaders, employees can do to help build trust when you can't have that, you know, handshake, that face-to-face -face in person, which is like how I've always done it. Like I've always like gotten closer to people, right? Just through physical contact. Right now we can't do that. And so now we're like, okay, how do I now operate in this new normal? Do you have any suggestions for, for establishing trust within our own teams? Yes. So one of the things that's really important is to convey this long-term perspective to help people understand that, hey, this is the new reality that you find yourself in. You know, this is going to be a long-term thing. A lot of people, like you said yourself, you started looking at the situation and you figured out from data visualizations that it's not going to be two weeks. That inherently undermines your trust for the government and for various figures that communicate about this when they say it's going to be two weeks and it's obviously going to be longer. And then, you know, shut down for another month and then shut down for three more months or something like that. That undermines trust. Each of those moments undermines trust. Whereas if you stay, say from the beginning, you know, this situation is real. <laughs> it's going to be bad. We are not sure how bad it's going to be but you need to be prepared for a couple of years of disruptions, at least. You know, it might be as long as five to seven years. That gives you the bad news <laughs> up front and says, okay, you know, we'll try to compensate to deal with it through shutting down for two weeks and seeing what happens. Then that gives you much more flexibility for saying, well, maybe we'll try another month, we'll try another three months, see what happens based on that information. Because people are right now prepared for a long-term struggle, a long-term conflict. And you want to get, you need to get these people, your employees, your vendors, your customers, you need to get them on board. You need to get them to be part of the ship. And you need to provide that basis for that long-term future. So you need to communicate to them about this long-term and at the same time build a vision of how you will survive and thrive in that long-term. Because right now, a lot of people are asking, you know, you, you might not be aware that they're asking, but a lot of your employees are asking, is my company going to be there? <laughs> is it going to still be around in this long-term situation? Are the leaders actually realizing how bad it will get? Or do they have a plan for the future? So you want to be working right now on developing that long-term plan. And you want to be developing a long-term plan for a couple of scenarios. One is the optimistic scenario of two to three years, and that might not sound optimistic to you, but that actually is the optimistic situation. So the optimistic scenario of two to three years, the more moderate scenario of five to seven years, and the more pessimistic scenario of eight to 10 years. So you want to have those more that optimistic, that moderate, and that pessimistic scenario. And you want to be telling your employees that, hey, we're getting this covered. You know, you want to be telling that to your vendors, you want to be telling that to your clients, we have this covered, we'll be around for even the most pessimistic scenario. And so that you want to be able to convey that. And you want to build that vision of a future and you're prepared for whatever future is going to happen. So that's one thing, that's communicating a vision of the future and helping people who you're leading see that you will be around and that you're prepared for the long term. Now, and that cultivates trust. Now, the other aspect of cultivating trust, you want to make sure to convey empathy. That's incredibly important. Conveying empathy is relatively easy face-to-face -face when you're, like you said, you can do a handshake and, and so on, touch somebody on the shoulder, say this is a tough situation. Much harder to do so virtually. So you need to learn how to tell good and effective stories about what you're doing and about what you're seeing stories that are emotionally engaging about the company, about yourself, about the employees, show employees that you actually do feel their pain. You understand where they are. You understand how they're suffering. You understand how they're anxious, how they're uncertain. These are things that you get. You viscerally get, you connect with them. So show them that you understand their pain, that you understand where they're coming from. And then show them how you will respond to their pain points. 
how you will respond to their anxieties, how you will respond to their grief. Right now, so many people are experiencing intense grief. Intense, they might not be realizing that's what they're experiencing, but they are because they lost the world that was there in January 2020 and February 2020. You know, how do they feel not being able to get together with their loved ones, with their friends, you know, with their grandparents? Or, you know, if you're younger, you should not be going to see people who are over 60 right now in this current context. And a lot of people are not, and they're doing the right thing, but they're losing them. They're losing social gatherings. So they're really feeling depressed, sad, anxious. They're feeling lost. And you want to be communicate and that you care about their private life and their private experience, as well as about their professional life. They're feeling a lot of anxiety about their professional life. So you want to be communicate that. So those things, the first things to think about, those are the two things, if you're only going to do a couple of things, those are the things that you want to be thinking about. Create that long-term vision for the future or the pessimistic, optimistic, moderate scenarios and show your employees your, and your other stakeholders that you plan to be around even in the pessimistic scenario and show realistically that you plan to be around in that. So show concrete ways that you can plan to do it. And then show empathy. Show empathy, especially for your employees, for the kind of pains that they're experiencing and the kind of suffering for which they're going, both in their personal life and, of course, in their professional life. I like that. And it's got to come from the heart because yes. there's so many examples of, like, fake empathy, right? And that mm. bothers me so much when, when you know that the words are shallow, when it's coming from somebody who's never shown empathy in the past. Like, that's the stuff that really bothers me. Yeah, it's what you were saying about before, how you can, you might can show and connect with people through a handshake and through, you know, through that face-to-face -face contact. You can't do that right now. So you need to do that in an alternative way, through stories, through showing that connection that you care. You mentioned something that I hadn't thought about. Um, you talked about conflict resolution. And I think right now, as a lot of us have just started working from home in the last three to four weeks, at least here in uh, the U.S., we're all, I think, being like super collaborative and trying to yeah. figure out solutions, right? We're all, but this is like the first month, right? Mm -hmm. But like you said, as this progresses and life happens and campaigns and projects happen, there's going to be conflict. It's just part of life. You're going to disagree on ways to go. And we're going to have to figure out, like, how to manage those conflicts. And I was wondering, as you have uh, consulted and worked with different companies, what are some strategies, some things that leaders, teams can be doing to help to resolve those conflicts in a in a um, an efficient way? One of the most important things, especially for virtual, virtually, is to over-communicate. Because you, right now, you're used to communicating less because a lot of communication can take place through casual office, chit chat conversations, you know, stop by, talk about things. But you need to communicate much more in a virtual setting to actually address problems. So that's one thing about communicating. The other thing about communicating that you want to be thinking about is tone. Tone is very easy to read in personal, person to person conversations. But it's much harder to read in textual conversations where much more of your communication is going to be happening. So you want to make sure to address potential ways that people can misinterpret you, mm -hmm. especially for people who are in a potential conflict. They are more likely to read your words from a more hostile perspective, not intentionally so, but it's just how they will feel, they, their gut reactions. So you want to make sure to revise your emails, your communications of various sorts, Slack messages, whatever, to make sure they're as positive and as collaborative as possible. So you need to go against your intuitions in those ways, in the, how you communicate. The amount of communication and the style of communication needs to be more positive. And then, of course, something that you know, seems simple, but I've seen way too many people fail at it, is when you are go getting into a tense conversation, actually jump and do a video on the video conference. Don't keep doing it by email. I've, I've had so many people who I had to resolve conflicts with because they kept communicating by email when they really should have gone to a video conference conversation. <laughs> so that is very important. And then the more senses you can get engaged, the more you can see other people, the less likely you'll have conflict because you can see their facial reactions and so on. 
and they can see yours. And just as importantly, you can humanize each other. You can show them that you're a human being. You can remind them that you're a human being. You know, start your conversation not by diving into the conflict, but by chit-chatting them. What's going on? How's your grocery shopping going? All that stuff. <laughs> are you still ordering out? <laughs> All that stuff that you know people are still struggling with. So point to that shared humanity and the shared sense of you know, trouble that you're all experiencing. So those are going to be the three pieces of advice I think that are going to be most helpful. Glad that this is all just fantastic, very, very practical for leaders. And I can see why you've worked and been consulting at companies like Aflac, Honda, Wells Fargo, Xerox, um, all over the world. Um, and also being featured in NPR, Scientific America, Time, Fast Company. You are so insightful and have shared so many great strategies for our leaders listening into this Data Talk podcast. Uh, for those that want to keep up with you, contact you, learn more about what you're doing right now uh, during this pandemic, how is, how is the best way for them to contact you? Well, they can check out my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Of course, your bookstores may not be open right now, but it's available in bookstores everywhere, published by a great traditional publisher called Korea Press. And of course, you can just order it from Barnes Noble, Amazon, and so on. It's available in audiobook form, physical book form, and digital. You can check out my resources on disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. There's going to be blogs, videos, podcasts, decision aids, guides, manuals, books, online classes, coaching, consulting, training, all online, of course. And you also want to check out, there's a great free class on disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe, eight video-based modules on making the wisest decisions. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. And finally, if you have any questions about anything you've heard in this podcast, I'm really widely available on LinkedIn, very active there. So connect with me, Dr. Gleb Sikorsky, G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. Awesome. And I'm going to put together a blog post with links to Gleb's social media profiles, his books, his website, and also the video courses that he just mentioned will all be there on our blog. Gleb, thank you again for sharing your insights with our community. It's a pleasure and a blast chatting with you. It's been great, Mike. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Data Talk. We share out new episodes every single week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes as well as YouTube videos by going to the Experian News blog. The URL is just experian.com slash data talk. And as always, we love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows, please reach out. You can find us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab, or you can always reach out to me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.